Good morning and welcome to Bible Center. I'm Pastor Mike. It's good to be with all of you. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving and thank you for coming. It's no little thing to kind of come out of that food coma and make it to church on Sunday. So nice work. Uh, we are in the second part of kind of a quick two-part series on gratitude to generosity. If you were here last week, you got to enjoy, enjoy Dr. John King. If you missed that sermon, it's online. I'd encourage you to watch it. It was called Gratitude and Beyond. Uh, he did a wonderful job. Love it when Dr. King is here with us. So after we finish up today, we're already moving into the Christmas season and our Christmas series, which is going to be called Bethlehem, the Advent of Hope. So for you, as you're preparing for the Christmas season, I would love for you to consider inviting some friends and some family with you to church uh, over the next couple weeks. This place is going to be decked out. If you've been to Bible Center before during Christmas time, we do Christmas big. Uh, it's a great time to just focus on and think about Christ and all he has done for us. So it's a wonderful time for you to invite friends and family and come be a part of what we do here. We'll sing songs that they're familiar with. It'll be warm and welcoming. So it's a great time to invite friends. So when we think about gratitude and we think about Christmas, one of the things that my mind goes to pretty quickly is Christmas morning, which is it's a month away, Christmas morning. And as a dad or a mom or a grandparent or uncle or an aunt, you've had those moments when you've bought gifts for that niece or that child and they tear open the gift and you know that you nailed it. Like tears come down, there's squealing, there's excitement. They're like, oh, they're so excited. They look at you and they say, thank you. That moment of gratitude just feels really good. If you've given enough gifts, you've also had this experience where they open up the package and it's, it's just not right, the right color. It's not the right brand. It's not the right size. Like you thought, I'll save 10 bucks by getting this brand and your child did not appreciate that at all. So it goes from this exuberant thank you to Thanks, Dad. Meh. And like, that's all you get. And those moments just don't feel as good as the other moments. And it's in those Christmas mornings when you just think about the fact, and it comes to mind that gratitude just shouldn't be deeply connected to those little moments. It should be something bigger than that. Our thankfulness, our gratitude just needs to be bigger than the right stuffed animal, the right Lego set, or that new bicycle. It's just got to be connected to something bigger than those little moments. Those moments matter, but there's something bigger in the background that should move us to a life of gratitude. In the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 17, uh, it describes this gratitude as being bigger than just getting what we want when we want it. It says this, whatever you do in word or deed, so everything you say, everything you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, which means all the words you speak, all the things you do, you are and I am called to do that in a way that honors the name of Jesus. We do it in his name for him. The verse continues and says, giving thanks through him, Jesus, to God the Father. So everything you say, everything you do, everything I say, everything I do is to be done in the name of Jesus to honor him while also giving thanks to him. So in everything we say, in everything coming into our life and the things that we're doing in our life, there should just be this heart of thankfulness, this heart of gratitude in all things. So in this verse, gratitude and thankfulness isn't described as a thing you do in a moment. It's described as a character quality. It's described as part of who you simply are, that you are a grateful person, that you're a thankful person in all things. It's descriptive of you. It isn't just thankfulness when we get the things we want. So our relationship with God should look very different than our relationship with our kids on, sun, on Christmas morning. It's not that God gives us exactly what we want and then we're thankful. The concept here is that in all things we're thankful. In the things we prefer, in the things we maybe don't prefer. That there's a response to God of gratitude. So it's also good to know that even though the Bible is teaching us that we should be people filled with gratitude, it should be the type of people we are, society, culture, and the world is telling you something very different. 
There's this constant theme in the background of your life of commercials and services and products calling out to you saying, you shouldn't be thankful until you get our product. You're not complete until you have this service. When you get all of these things lined up just right in your life, then, then you're going to be happy, filled with joy, content, and thankful. God looks at this very differently. In fact, as we go to Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're going to see that getting all the stuff we want might actually be dangerous to our hearts, not helpful to our hearts. So turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And as we jump in today, we're going to have two main points. The first point, we're going to look at the relationship between gratitude and our circumstances. Gratitude and our circumstances. Then in our second point, we're going to look at the relationship between gratitude and hope. Gratitude and hope. The first point is gratitude is not based on our circumstances. I didn't leave a lot of suspense with how I wrote that point, but gratitude is not based on circumstances. So in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we've got a group of people, the Israelites, they're up on the edge of the promised land, ready to go in for the second time. The first group earlier went up to the edge of the promised land. They didn't trust that God would take it for them. They didn't trust that God could conquer the people in the land for them. So God turned that group around sent them back into the wilderness, and they died off. So this is their kids. So this is the second group of people. They've received the law a second time. Deuteronomy means second law, so they've received the law again. Now they're ready to go in. And God has this moment with Moses where he wants Moses to prepare the people. And this isn't really a really good-feeling passage as we get into it. He's about to teach Moses a song, a song that he is to teach to the people of Israel that's going to be a witness against them. In verse 19, it says, God speaking to Moses, now write down this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. So there's a song that God is going to give Moses. Moses is going to teach the people and the function of this song will be, the song itself will be a witness for God, for God against them. So in verse 20, we have the song. I'm not going to try to sing it. Uh, even as I read it, you're going to think, that doesn't feel like a song. I don't think that was the point of the song. Um, maybe in Hebrew, this rhymes better than it does in English. Um, but this is the song that he gives Moses to teach the people. And after he gives it to them, they sing this song and they memorize it. When I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised on oath to their ancestors... And when they eat their fill and thrive, they will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me and breaking my covenant. End of song. That's the song. So Moses is going to take this song to the Israelites and they practice it. Verse 21, he takes it to them and they practice it. And the song is basically a song saying is, when you get all the things you want... A land flowing with milk and honey, which means it's a land of excess. Everything you could possibly want is here in this land. The best of what the earth provides is right here, and it's yours. I'm giving it to you. And when you have it, when you are full, when you are thriving and flourishing, what's going to happen then? They will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me and breaking my covenant. Verse 21 says, And when many disasters and calamities come on them, this song will testify against them because it will not be forgotten by their descendants. I know what they are disposed to do even before I bring them into the land that I promise them on oath. So Moses wrote down this song that day and taught it to the Israelites. So the land was flowing with milk and honey. They had everything they needed and there's something inside of us that just thinks when you and I get everything that we want and we need and we have it overflowing, that's when we're going to be thankful. That's when we're going to be filled with gratitude. We just tend to believe that. But what we learn from this song and from the experience and from the example is that excess does not lead to gratitude. Excess, abundance, thriving, flourishing, 
having all the things that I want does not promise, does not guarantee, does not lead to gratitude. In some ways, what it appears is that the opposite is true. When they got everything they wanted, they didn't look to God and say, now I'm going to live a life of thankfulness to you. When they got everything they wanted and more, the response was, I don't really need you. I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to go worship who I want to worship in the way I want to worship. And they turn their backs from God. So excess does not necessarily lead to gratitude. And again, everything around you is telling you the opposite. Everything around you is telling you you're one step away from finally having happiness, happiness that you'll be thankful for. If you just have this particular thing or this look, or you go to this location, have this vacation, you have this accessory, this car, this neighborhood, this degree, this workout, this particular body weight, this, 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 then you'll be happy. You'll find some contentment. Then you're going to be a thankful person. Like, that's what we're told, and there's something inside of us that tends to believe that. And that's why that song, to them, is a nice reminder to us. Getting everything you want, having an abundance in your life, actually can be a very dangerous thing. It's the thing we tend to work towards. It's the thing we tend to pray for. It's the thing we put a lot of effort into but at the same time, it can be very dangerous. Because when we get the stuff, our trust can move from God to the stuff. When we actually have some excess, when we have some abundance, our trust goes sometimes from God to our abundance, to our excess. The land of plenty can become a land of drifting and wandering from God. Because what actually happens is excess often leads to distraction from God. Excess often leads to distraction from God. Does it mean it's wrong to have stuff? No. Does it mean it's wrong to work hard? Absolutely not. It's a question of pursuit and energy. If your pursuit and energy towards stuff is up here and your pursuit and energy towards God is here, then yeah, now there's a problem. We have to switch those. Where's your energy going towards? Jesus said it very clearly. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will also be. So is your treasure the Lord, or is your treasure the stuff, or the pursuit of stuff, or a number in a bank account? Where does your trust, where does your energy go? God knows what we need. And God knows that the number one thing that we need is him. God knows what we need. He knows the number one thing we need is the work of Jesus in our life every single day. That's the thing that we need. Not necessarily another thing, but more of him. My wife and I lived in Mexico for a year uh, as missionaries. And the second half of the year, we lived in this, no, first half of the year, we lived in this apartment. Uh, it, was, it was a building, a small building with eight apartments, and we lived on the fourth floor, and it wasn't big, and in Mexico, where we were, there were no windows in the apartment, so it was just kind of an open air thing. When it was hot outside, it was hot inside. That's just kind of how it went. Uh, Now, at the base of the building, on the side, there was a guy who lived kind of up against the apartment building. He had fashioned for himself sort of a cardboard house of some sort, and a little bit of like a rickety fence that he had found just from stuff he found on the ground, and he had chickens. So it was this guy and his chickens. He also had a rooster, and this rooster never missed a sunrise. Again, there were no windows in the apartment, so we and the rooster spent every morning together celebrating the coming of the sun. But this fella, who didn't have a whole lot, whenever you stop by and talk to him, and I'll be honest, he wasn't easy to understand, and I'm not great at Spanish, but when you talked to him, he had a huge smile. He was happy to see you. You never heard him grumble. He was in a better mood than most people I know in my life right now, probably including me. And I don't even know if he knew the Lord, but he just was this example of you don't have have to have a lot of stuff 
to be a thankful person. Probably if I asked him, he would have given me a chicken. I should have asked for the rooster. <laughs> but it's just a reminder to me that more stuff doesn't equal more gratitude. More stuff doesn't equal more gratitude. It may be accurate to say sometimes less stuff equals more gratitude because we can stay focused on what's most important. So we're going to jump from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Jesus has this interesting story in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem, in verse 11, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. So Samaria were a group of people that uh, the Jews hated, disliked. And Jesus is like walking right there on the border. And it says in verse 12, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. They called out loud, Jesus, master, have pity on us. Now in that day and age, and possibly still today, leprosy was basically a death sentence. Like it was a physical death sentence. It was a social death sentence. You got put into a camp and like cast out. It was an economic death sentence. You were also basically cast out from your spiritual people, like you were separated from them. You were unclean. And it says in verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. So on their way to see the priests, which means Jesus said, go to the priests, and they believed Jesus, and in their faith, they went to the priest, and on the way, they were cleansed from their leprosy. Now, there's an, an author from a couple of decades ago named Chuck Swindoll, and he would say that this healing, this healing of leprosy, would be comparable to raising someone from the dead. Like, this was no little miracle. Like, when you're healed from leprosy, everything about you changes. You're basically brought back from the dead. You can go back to your family. You've got a shot economically. You can go back to the people that you love and you know you're not going to die in the fashion you were going to die before. And in verse 15 it says, one of them, one of them when he saw he was healed came back praising God in a loud voice. That one individual threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him and he was a Samaritan, which would have been surprising to the Jews. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So what an interesting passage. I think most of us believe that if we were physically healthy, you know that thing on your body that hurts? You've all got something. Maybe it's a couple of things. Maybe you've got a list. You've got so many things you need, like a list to keep track of all the things that hurt on your body, in your body. There's something inside of us that just think, if we can check all those things and say, that doesn't hurt today, that doesn't hurt today, that doesn't hurt today, that we would just be overwhelmed with gratitude and thankfulness towards God. This passage just gives us something different. Here's an example of 10 guys who were basically at death's door. They were being destroyed and crushed by this disease, something worse than probably most of us are ever going to have to deal with. And in response, 10%, one out of 10, responded with incredible gratitude, praise and thanksgiving to Jesus, to God the Father, for being healed and changed physically. So I think it's fair to say Physical well-being does not necessarily lead to gratitude. Physical well-being doesn't mean that now my life has changed and I'm always going to be thankful. Maybe it's a bit more like Christmas morning. And you've experienced this. You get out of bed and you're like, my feet don't hurt today. Thank you, Lord. But then you go through the rest of the day and you're like, now my feet hurt. Well, that stinks later in the day and maybe you're not as thankful anymore. So sometimes even when it comes to our health and the physical stuff, it's kind of momentary in its nature. Yes, it feels better to feel better. But even when you wake up and have a good day, two good days, a good week, it's very possible by the end of your week, you're no longer remembering to thank God 
all the time for the fact that you feel good, for your health, for your well-being. Because so often, things are just momentary and temporary for us. Things and circumstances and stuff are temporary. Our health and our well-being actually, like it or not, is temporary. A secret, no one makes it out. Things don't keep getting better for us physically, no matter how hard we work out. And I try, I like to work out. Things just don't always get better. So in this world, circumstances, even physical well-being, neither of those things necessarily lead to a life of gratitude where we have this enduring, ongoing, life-changing gratitude that God has called us to. So I would suggest that as long as our hope is coming from anything in this world, anything, you, your body, your stuff, something outside of you, another person, as long as your thankfulness and gratitude is coming from something on this earth, your gratitude will be lacking, fleeting, waning. Why? Because we've placed our faith in things that are uncertain, unstable, things that will not endure. So, where do we find a hope that leads to enduring and ongoing gratitude? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Michelle read this earlier, and we're just going to kind of sit in these verses for a little bit. So if you have your Bible, open with me to 1 Timothy 6 and uh, verse 17. And we're just going to look at this a little bit and see how God talks to us about this connection between hope in eternal things and gratitude. Verse 17 says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. Pause. When we read this verse, there's this tendency inside of us to think whenever we read the word rich, it's referring to the person in the economic bracket right above us, right? You did that, didn't you? You didn't think about you. You thought about someone else. You looked over into another seat. Yeah, talking to that guy, talking to that lady. When it says, command those who are rich in this present world, I just would suggest to you that we need to put our own names and ourselves into that spot. Random stats. They're real, but they're random. In 2019, there was like a worldwide look at like household incomes. If your household income is 28,000 or more, you are in the top 20% of wealthy people in the world, not the US, the world. 28,000 for your whole household. If you make 55,000 a year as a household, you're in the top 10% in the whole world. So there's 90% of the world looking at you saying, you're the people in the bracket. You can make 55 or more. Those stats probably include most people in this room. Because I know you're interested. If you make 155,000, you're top 1% for household income. 1%. So don't put someone else's name in there. Let's assume Paul is talking to us and Jesus has something for us here. Command those who are rich, us, in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. So the first warning here is to us, and the warning is, hey, if you're starting to put your hope in what you have, in your stuff, or even in the stuff that your wealth can provide for you, that stuff is uncertain. You're not going to like where that goes. Just the word uncertain is good just to sit in for a minute. It means it's going to not be there at some point. It's not stable. You can't structure your life on it. We tend to, but what Jesus is saying here is pause. It's a warning. If you're putting your hope in your stuff, slow down. Here comes the contrast. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. What interesting words are used there. So notice the warning and the contrast. Don't do this, but do this. Don't put your hope, that is, you're looking to the future, and I know I'm going to get there. I know that things are going to work out the way they should. Like, don't put your hope in your stuff. But instead of thinking that way, put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. 
and you're thinking, well, the everything I want is wealth, so why can't I just go back to the wealth thing? God knows what you need more than you know what you need. And what we all need is more of him. So when we put our hope in God, we're saying, I'm trusting you. I want more of you. And when I go to my prayers and I start talking to God, I start asking for things like this. God, I don't necessarily want more things. I want more of you. I want more time with you. I want more conversations with you. I want more conversations with others about you. We shift from our stuff or our wealth to putting our hope in God. So the centerpiece of this contrast is hope. You're going to have hope somewhere. You're not going to wake up tomorrow without hope. Like you're going to place your faith in something. The question is, what are you going to place your faith into? And that's the, that's the crux of what's happening here. Is your hope going to be in your stuff? And I struggle with it. You struggle with it. Is it going to be in your stuff or is it going to be in the Lord? One is called uncertain, and one is the eternal, enduring forever, God who made everything. So I would suggest to you this. Life-changing gratitude comes from life-changing hope. Life-changing, consistent, ongoing, enduring gratitude does not come from putting our trust, our hope, in wealth, which is uncertain. You can't have thankfulness when you feel like your feet are shifting. You can't be thankful when the thing you're hoping in is something you can't depend on. You're going to have thankfulness and gratitude when you securely put your feet and your hope in God himself, and he can secure you and strengthen you and prepare you for tomorrow. When you do that, now you're in a position to have contentment, to have this just enduring joy, and from those things, gratitude starts to come forth. So if we don't get the hope thing right, gratitude in our life doesn't have a shot. So not gratitude in our things, gratitude in our God. That's where we start. So our basis for hope is the Lord and the work of Jesus in our life. More often... More stuff leads to more hope in stuff rather than more hope in Jesus. I want us to think of hope this way. When we hope in God, and if you look at 1 Timothy, it's a discussion of the work of the gospel in your life. To have hope in God looks like this. I have hope in what Jesus has done. I have hope in what Jesus is doing. And I have hope in what Jesus will one day do. When you're thinking about hope, you think about the fact that Jesus came and died on the cross for you. And everything that you couldn't do for yourself, that is save yourself, Jesus did for you. He died on the cross and offered salvation to you, something you couldn't do on your own. And because of that, you have a firm foundation. You can put your hope in that salvation, in the work of Jesus. And then Jesus goes on to say, I'm going to keep working in you until you come into the fullness of me. He's going to complete the work that he started in you, Philippians 1.6. So I also have confidence and hope, not just in what he did, but in what he's doing, that today matters because Jesus is working in me today. And when I wake up tomorrow, it's another day where Jesus is going to work in me tomorrow. I can have hope in that. He died on the cross to save me and to transform me. Not to save me and leave me, but to save me and transform me. So this hope is that Jesus isn't done with me yet. Oh, that feels good, doesn't it? All of a sudden, you're starting to get some security. You're starting to find your footing. There can be some thankfulness in that. There can be some enduring gratitude in that. And also that what Jesus is going to do. That one day, he comes back, and he makes all things new. Where you wanted your feet to stop hurting, maybe that's just me. I want my feet to stop hurting, and whatever it is that you have that you want to stop hurting, he comes back and he wipes that pain away. You're given a new body on a new earth and new heaven when he puts them together in our forever home with him. So hope also comes from what he's going to do, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he's going to do. So when we put our hope in the temporary, it reduces our gratitude. 
when we put our hope in Jesus in the eternal, it increases our gratitude. So not here, but in him, gratitude goes here. So some practical thoughts. How can you start working this a little bit more into your life? One thought would be is just at your dinner table or when you're at lunch with a friend or out with a friend. Spend some time talking about the areas where you're thankful that Jesus is working your life right now. I would love for that to be a normal part of our conversation consistently, talking about what Jesus is doing in our life right now, because when you talk about that, you start putting more hope into that. So actively, often talk about what Jesus is doing in your life. Have that be something your kids talk to you about, and you talk to your kids about. When that happens, our hope grows, and therefore our gratitude grows. Think about your prayers. When you're praying, and it's not wrong to pray for stuff, it's good to pray for stuff, but are you spending more time praying for stuff or more time praying for more of him? Just think about your prayers. Again, it's not wrong to pray for stuff, but he knows what you need and he's told us what we need. We need more of him, more hope in him. Ask for it. Ask for it. So another practical thing is when you pray, ask for more hope, growing hope in God and the work of Jesus. Verse 18, let's go back to 1 Timothy. It says in verse 18, command them, that is the rich, that's us, command these people, command me, to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So when we take our hope out of the uncertainty, when we take hope away from our wealth and put it in God, then this starts to happen. We start to live a life where we're rich, not in our wealth, but we're rich in good deeds. And we're rich in generosity, sharing the things that we have. And if you notice in the verse, generosity is a beautiful thing. When you share the stuff you have with others, it is for eternal reward. You're laying up treasures in heaven. So there's this movement that we've seen. Your gratitude will not come from your circumstances. Circumstances are always changing. Gratitude will not come from the stuff that you have. Your gratitude will not even come from how good you feel. It will for a moment, but not enduring gratitude. Gratitude comes from this enduring hope that we have in God. And what it looks like here, according to this verse, is when we're filled with gratitude... Hope in God creates gratitude, and gratitude overflows into generosity. Good works and generosity. So this whole sermon series, from gratitude to generosity, is this beautiful movement that we see here in this verse. That when we understand all that Christ has done for us, and we put our hope in Him, His final work, and His ongoing work in our life, now there's this response of, thank you. Yeah, this doesn't feel good. Yeah, my bank account might not be where it is. Yeah, I'd like one more of those. But goodness, Lord, in light of all of that, in light of eternity, thank you. Thank you. So your life should not look like Christmas morning. There's moments of greater thankfulness and lower, but you should have this ongoing, consistent overflow of gratitude in your life. And gratitude in your life looks like generosity towards others. If you find yourself not being generous towards other people, quickly sharing the things that you have, then it's time to work on gratitude. And it's a conversation about hope. Hope in God, not in your stuff. Because when your hope is in your stuff, it's hard to let go of it, right? If your hope is in your stuff, you're not going to let go of it. But when your hope is in Jesus, you're free to let go of lots of your stuff and to share it. And when you share it, you're storing up for yourself eternal, forever rewards if you like to invest, invest to where it's always going to be in eternity. Your house is not much different than the cardboard house on the side of that apartment building in light of eternity. Both will wash away one day. Both will be gone. So invest in the things that matter. Invest in other people. And by doing so, you invest in eternity. May gratitude move to generosity. Let's pray. Father, these are not easy words that you've shared with us. Uh, there's a warning here. 
you push us and call us to not trust in the things that we see, but in the things that we don't see. And Lord, I pray that we would trust in you, Jesus. That we would recognize all that you have done. That we'd recognize what you're doing in our life right now. And with incredible eager hope that we'd anticipate what you're going to be doing in our life through all of eternity. And I pray, Father, that you would allow us to be people who are filled with gratitude and that gratitude overflows into generosity, that we be quick to give away our things as you were quick to lay down your life for us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.